Good morning. I don't know what the big deal is about being bold. I don't know what the big deal is. You know, honestly, when I first started losing my hair, it was a big deal. I used to spend more time on my hair than Jane, and, and I believe what Scripture says, the Lord gives and takes away, and sometimes it's to humble us and keep us humble. Well, when Jane and I were first married, this was before kids, we had been married a couple years, Jane and I were still working on our communication differences, To be honest, 22 years later, we're still working on our communication differences, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story was a time when we were at our church in Cincinnati, and we were there, and we had this huge work day, and I remember all the work that we were going to do that day was finished, and some people were hanging out and just talking and fellowshipping. And so there was a couple of us that were like, hey, let's go get on stage, you know, And, and so... There was just three of us. My friend Jason grabbed the guitar, and he's, he's over there, and he's, he's going to sing. I grabbed a microphone, and so did this sweet girl by the name of Kendra. And Kendra had a beautiful voice, but she was so shy. She did not want to sing in front of anybody. So the three of us, it was pretty safe, right? So there, there we were, and it didn't take long until my favorite worship song, Jason, started playing. It was a song from several years ago. This was several years ago. I could sing of your love forever. And that was my worship jam. Love that song. And there was this harmony part that I could sing. And this harmony part, I I love to sing it. So the three of us were were there. And I I was kind of into it, you know. All of a sudden, that harmony part, it was sounding good. I, I, I was nailing it. It was right there, and, I, and I'm starting to, oh, boy, this is, this is really great, you know. Then people start coming in, and they start gathering around. So I get my worshipful squinty eyes, you know, oh, you know, really, really impactful. Oh, you know, but I, but I can see, right, they're all coming in. I start singing a little bit louder, a little prouder, right. And here I, and then Jane comes in, and that's when I was still trying to impress her. <laughs> Not anymore, you know, no. So I remember her coming in, and she had a friend with her. And, and so I'm just singing away, worshipful squinty eyes and everything. And I see her pointing, pointing at me. And I'm thinking, she's telling her friend how good I sound. I mean, it's totally what I'm thinking. This is how messed up, right? And so I'm thinking, oh, so I'm just over there, oh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Then I see her waving, and I'm like, She's totally digging this, right? So I'm just over there. So I wave back. I'm just, oh, you know. Then she's like going like this. And I'm just like, oh, you know, totally. Until finally, I open my worshipful squinty eyes, and I see that she's actually saying, stop, stop. Remember Kendra? Well, obviously, I forgot about Kendra. I was so full of Daryl. My head had gotten so big at this point that I was drowning everybody out. And Kendra started to put her microphone down and was starting to walk away. Here I was thinking Jane was like, oh, you're so great. You know, she was like, shut up. Because the problem was, for one, I lost sight of what that song was about singing about God. Instead, I was worshiping me. And not only that, I totally missed Kendra. She didn't need prideful Daryl. Nobody needs prideful Daryl. She needed humble Daryl that could see her, encourage her, lift her up. Now, I'll be honest. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't feel good to get knocked off of the prideful pedestal, does it? Sometimes that's a long fall. Being served some humble pie doesn't feel very good. But it is so important for us to see God and see others. And so as we come to the end of this belief series, 30 weeks we've been on this journey. Some of you, you've been with us just a little bit. Some of you have been every week. And and I hope that you have really allowed God's truth to speak to you. 
Because it's not just believing, but it's that our beliefs in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and His Holy Word, that that changes how we live. But not only that, but then through the power of Jesus Christ, through the ministry of the Spirit, it changes who we are. And we start becoming more like Jesus. But the thing is, is our topic today, humility, is not a fruit of the Spirit. That's what we've been looking at. So why? Why end on humility? Why is humility so important? That's why I want to talk about today. Because humility is what keeps us on the potter's wheel. Humility is what keeps us in God's hands to be formed, molded, changed. Because as long as you have breath, God still is doing a good work in you. You never get to the point to say, oh, I've arrived. I've been a Christian long enough. I've heard all this before, and I've got it all together. Wrong. All of us are in that place that God is continually doing a work so that our faith leads into how we live and through the power of God changes us. And humility is what keeps us in that place, that place that all these things are held in God's hands as we say over and over and live over and over, I am yours. I'm yours, God. And so as we look at humility, it makes total sense that the end of this series, which is really about being a follower of Jesus, ends on this valuable, vital issue of being humble. I read about a story, a true, true story that happened in 1884. The king of Italy was woken up in the middle of the night. A messenger had come to him. And this messenger came to him and told him of this horrible epidemic of cholera that was completely sweeping across Naples. Now, the king was supposed to go to Mansa the next day for this huge banquet where he was going to be celebrated and all of, all of his kingdom and everybody was going to be like, oh, this guy's awesome and throw this huge feast. And, you know, and who, who doesn't like to have a little bit of celebration for, for, you know, oh, you did a great job, right? Well, this king, King Humber, sent a telegraph to the people in Monza. And this is what he said. Banquet at Monza. Cholera at Naples. I'm going to Naples. If you don't see me again, goodbye. He knew the risk of going. He stepped down from his throne. He humbled himself to place the people in Naples as greater value than him. And he went with the risk of his life. And when he went, he went and held their hand. He served the people there. Now, all of the rich and all of the officials had already left Naples. It was just the common people. And there was this humble king who placed such a great value on these people. And one day, there was a, a minister came to him and said, Your Majesty, there were 3,400 cases yesterday. This is getting alarming. You need to return to Rome. And here was his response. You may go if you like. I shall remain till I see Naples free from cholera. And that he did. He stayed until the epidemic had broken and people were on recovery. Thousands of lives were lost, and this king took the place of humility. Now, doesn't this remind you of another story? Doesn't this remind you of another true event where Jesus, being in very nature God, humbled himself, became a man, 
came in the midst of our epidemic. And he took our sin upon himself and he died for us. Jesus is a perfect picture of humility where Jesus valued us above himself. And as Christians, we are to have that same mind, that same mindset of Jesus where we don't look at ourselves and go, I got the microphone, I'm singing the sweet harmony part, look at waving at people, look how great I am. No, but we see God and see others and value them above ourselves. That's what we are called to be as Christians. Humility means that it's not about us. And that's completely opposite of our culture, isn't it? Our culture says, look up, Look out for good old number one. But God's like, no. If you want to think like Jesus, act like Jesus, and become like Jesus, you must become less. You must become less. This leads to our key question. Now, I have to be honest. I'm a little excited about this being the last of the keys. I'm a little keyed out here. We've been doing key question, key idea, key verse every week. If somebody offers me their keys, I'm probably going to throw them. I'm just done with keys. But these have been good. These have been good things for us to be able to understand. And this is our last key question. What does it mean to value others before myself? That's what we're called to. There's no question in Scripture that we are to value others before ourselves. And then this is God's plan. The key idea. I choose to esteem others above myself. I choose to put others. Now, let's just be honest. That's really tough. Especially in a family because you like push everybody's buttons, right? And the last thing you want to do is say... I value you more than me. And then they take advantage of you and you're sitting there like, oh, life stinks, Daryl's dumb, you know. But something happens when we put somebody else above ourselves. We are actually allowing God to change us and to change them. Let's look at our key verse, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Philippians 2, 3 through 4, the Apostle Paul and, and I, love, I love this because there's no question here. There's, there's no like, oh, what's he saying? How much am I? How no, no, clear. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, here's what we're supposed to do. In humility... Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Only God can work that in us because we are selfish people. And we get hurt and we get our little walls up and we're like, I'm not going to be vulnerable to so-and-so or who and who or whatever. I'm not going to do that. And what Paul is saying, what God is saying here, is that we are ultimately being vulnerable to God and allowing God to do a good work that we can't do on our own. And when we take that place of valuing others, looking to their interests above our own, we become more and more like Jesus. And I don't know about you, but in my family, my wife and my kids need me to become more and more like Jesus. The people in the community, you all, People in your lives, they need you to become more and more like Jesus because that's what a world needs. They need to see the fullness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God changing the church. So how do we do that? How do we live out this humility? How do we take this pride and just allow God to just peel it away from us? How do we do this? I'd like to offer three things. Three things. The first is humility starts by understanding our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, if you are a new creation, that is the beginning. 
we must continually live and stay in that identity. Not let the world define us. Not let the world tell us how to live, but live in who we are. Let me give you an example of this. In the late 1800s, a faithful missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, God did so many things to change the lives of so many people in China in the late 1800s through this powerful missionary. He was called to speak at a large Presbyterian church in Australia. And the minister there was, was going to introduce him, and, and he, he was going to introduce him, and, and he outlined all of these accomplishments. And then as Hudson Taylor's getting ready to speak, this minister introduced him as our illustrious guest. Our illustrious guest. Now here is what separates one who is truly a follower of Christ and one who is truly about lifting themselves up. Here's what a follower of Christ looks like. Taylor stood quietly for a moment, opened his message by saying, Dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master named Jesus. It wasn't about him. Any good that had happened in his life was all because of Jesus. And when we get to that point that we come to the end of ourselves and we start to see, you know what? If this would have been me, I would have totally made a fool of myself. I would have totally made it about me. But you know what? Thank you, God, because Jesus is at work in my life and I could actually hear someone's needs and allow God to speak through me. See, any good in us is the power of God at work in us. And when we see ourselves only through the power, power, authority, and grace of Jesus Christ, the only time we stand tall is to lift Jesus up and to glorify him. That's what it means to be a follower. We are so humbled because we want Jesus to be exalted. And our value, our worth, our identity is in him alone. I'd like to share with you, remind you, who you are in Christ. Because when we see Jesus Christ in the fullness of who he is, we will become less so he can become greatest. I just want to share some of this with you. I hope these are things that we can allow the Holy Spirit to write upon our heart. And so when we feel less than, which really that's selfishness, that's pride just turned upside down. We can know who we are in Christ. When we think that we're all that in a bag of chips and we don't need anything or anyone, may we be brought back to who we are in Christ. And when we try to hide certain areas of our life and even rope that area off from God, may we know who we are in Christ and say, I'm all yours. Here are some things. John 1, 12, God says, if you are in Christ, then you are his child. You're his children. That's who you are. Romans 5, 1, that we have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. John 15, 15, we are called a friend of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, we are a part of the precious body of Christ. Philippians 3, 20, our citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. Ephesians 1, 3, we have access to every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1, 18, we are called saints. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, we are called ministers of reconciliation. Ephesians 1, 9, we have a purpose. Ephesians 1, 12, we have hope. Ephesians 2, 14, we have peace. We are God's masterpiece, his workmanship. Ephesians 2, 10, we are the holy temple of God through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 13 through 14, we are strong. Ephesians 6, 10, we will grow Colossians 2, 7, and we are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When we see ourselves and see our value and our worth through the identity and the victory of Jesus Christ, we have no other place to be but to be humble, so he is exalted. That is who we are, because more importantly, that's who he is. 
The second thing is this. Yes, we, we live and we walk humbly through our identity in Christ, but then that leads to this. Humility demands I place others before myself. I place others before myself. That means every relationship, others before myself because I know who I am in Jesus Christ. No longer fighting for your value and worth. No longer trying to be good enough or accepted. No longer trying to fit some model of what someone says you have to be. It is all through Jesus Christ. And the result is that of that is we see others through that identity. And th- see others through his eyes. And we place them above ourselves. Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 10.24 says, No one. And I love this. Again, I mean, there's no question here. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And as we daily seek Christ as our identity, we will grow in humility. And Jesus will be everything to us. And every relationship will be surrendered to him. We are to have the mind or the mindset of Jesus. We see that in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So this takes our key verse and starts to expand it and say, now what does this look like and who is our example, but who is our power to be humble? And it is Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, have the same attitude, have the same view. As that of Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God. Did not consider equality with God. Something to be used to his own advantage. Rather. Jesus made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man. What did he do? He humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You are saved because God himself humbled himself, valued you greater than his life. He died for you. But not only that, Jesus did not just die to save us, but Jesus died to change us so we could live in his example, but also live in his victory that we can know who we are And live that out in every relationship. The last thing is this. Humility requires brokenness. Humility requires brokenness. This is not something that we wake up every morning and say, I want to be more broken. I want to be in pieces. I want my weakness just to consume me. But here's the thing. Brokenness is ultimately that position of our life to say, I need Jesus Christ to overcome my sin, overcome my frailty, to overcome my weakness, overcome my inadequacies. Brokenness is saying, I'm all yours. It's not about me. I'm not strong enough. I'm not good enough. I can't do this. Brokenness is surrender. I'd like to share from a book. Kyle Eidelman, pastor, author, wrote this book, The End of Me. And he points out how in the physical world, broken things lose their value. Right? If something breaks, what do you do? You get rid of it and you get something new. Well, that's how the world works. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. Because in the spiritual world, the reverse is true. Broken things become more precious. Broken people reveal the beauty and the power of God. Eidelman shares that God uses our brokenness. That he takes our broken pieces and he remolds them into something beautiful. How many times do we want to hide our flaws? We want to hide our mistakes. We want to hide our weaknesses. And so we cover them up. That's pride. To be able to say, yeah, I'm struggling in this area of my life, but over here is this huge area. You don't let anybody in. Guess what? 
you are saying, God, you're not big enough for that. Jesus' power is not great enough for that. So I'm just going to present these broken pieces, but not this. There is this Japanese artwork that's called kintsugi. And it was developed in Japan in the 1500s. And what happens is they take broken ceramic pieces and they don't hide the cracks, but they boldly highlight them and repair them with gold. Here's a picture. Most of us would go, oh, this thing's broken. <laughs> Throw it away. It has no value. But with, kits, with Kintsugi, they put it back together with something that is more valuable. So now what was broken is now restored and is more valuable than it would have been if it wasn't broken. And that is the economy of the kingdom of the heaven. That is the economy of God's children. When God takes our brokenness and says, you know what? This brokenness is what's going to lead you to my power. This brokenness is what is going to surrender your life to let me work and I get the glory. Because brokenness is not to be hidden to say, oh, I'm not good. You're not good enough. But the power of Jesus is that gold that now reveals God's glory and reveals our worth and reveals our value because brokenness in God's kingdom equals beauty. A mess in God's kingdom equals a masterpiece because that is the power of Jesus. If you want to think, act, become like Jesus, then you got to stay in that place to say, I'm nothing without you, Jesus. I have nothing. I can do nothing. It is only by the power that is at work in me that I am anything. And because of you, Jesus, I am everything because you, you are my redeemer. All of us, we are like Kensuke. But we need to stop holding pieces away and saying, no, I can't, I can't, I can't let go of these pieces. Because what happens is we allow the brokenness to define us instead of the redemption. When we give those pieces to Jesus Christ, he alone works the power to restore. I'd like to share just a couple scriptures and then I'd like to wrap up. You see, Jesus... He was the perfect king. He is the perfect king that left his throne, took on our brokenness. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for us. He died for us on the cross so he would change brokenness forever. Jesus was broke for us so we could be healed. Jesus died for us so that now our weakness could be brought into his strength. This is what it says in Isaiah 53, 5. And this was prophesied way before Jesus walked this earth. But he was wounded for the wrong we did. He was crushed for the evil we did. The punishment which made us well was given to him. And we are healed because of his wounds. Praise God that Jesus became broken so we could be made whole. So now let's embrace that brokenness because we are embracing the restoration. One more scripture. Psalms 51, 17. This is what God desires. If you believe, if you are seeking Christ, if you are allowing God to change you, this is the place that we will be continually positioned before God. The sacrifice you desire, O oh God, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Where are you today? What pieces do you need to give up so God can make you whole in Christ? What is it in your life? Are you standing there with a microphone and overshadowing Kendra? Do you need to step aside and go, you know what? 
it's not about me and praise God it's not about me because it has to be about Jesus in their life and their life and their life and in my life. Because it's ultimately to that place when we are broken, when we are humble, that we say, Jesus, I'm yours. Do your good work. Do in me what I can't do. Through your grace, change me. Humility, God gives grace to the humble. God does in us what we can't do and don't deserve.